Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Seek and Destroy. And I know it's been a while since we've done a Seek and Destroy episode, but I want to try to get to our 300th episode and kind of cap off the show because we're already full on swinging with Seek at Night. And that's going to be the new primary show on this channel as we get near the end of the Venom vlog as well. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. If you're watching this, this is a double review because I like doing these because I have a friend named Tajaya, T-L-A, aka Blacktastic Media, who does awesome stuff on YouTube. I'm going to put a link to his channel down below. And pretty much every year for the last few has consecutively put out an independent film. Uh, most of them are short films in the sense that like they go up to an hour, then like a full feature. But this one, The Lookout, is a new movie that he made about, you know, pretty much someone who is a lookout for a heist that's going on. And that I thought was a really great premise. And he actually did it in a less than 20 minute short film type thing. So normally he'll do go up to like an hour. And some of my criticisms is like, oh, well, this probably could have been trimmed. But of course, I think that way I'm an editor. And that's just my personal opinion. And what I really like about Tajaya is that he'll go, hey, I appreciate your honest opinion. Like you're giving me feedback and if I can implement it in something I do in the future, I will. But of course, I like making things my way. And and I'm like, good. I mean, just because I'm giving out my opinion doesn't mean I want it to change that way or want you to change how you make things. You do as an artist what makes you most comfortable and what you feel is most accomplishing. And, and he's really cool about feedback. So I'm going to give some today on his new film, The Lookout. But I like to pair these reviews with something else that's out there that may be more mainstream so that way I could hopefully get more eyes on this. So I'm going to spend the first like five minutes or so talking about The Lookout and then the last like 10 minutes or so I'm going to give you my overall thoughts on Fallout, which is an Amazon show based on a video game series that I've never played but I've actually know a little bit about and even tried to make references to in some ways in a comic book that I did a while ago called The Last Time Travel on Earth, which never got released. But it was uh, heavily influenced in one aspect at least from fallout so we will talk about that a little bit coming up here but i want to start with the lookout uh, by black tastic media again i'm going to put a link to his channel down below and to this film down below so please go watch it and let your thoughts be known in his comment section because i, I know he loves feedback so please let him know over there so this film is basically like a kind of like a gone in 60 seconds type but it's you know condensed so it's less than 20 minutes and it stars tajaya and a couple of his friends or other you know, actors that he got along the way, uh, Stephanie and also Charles. And there's a bunch of great people in here that he has because I thought every little character, even though they only had little moments, which that was probably my biggest criticism is I wanted to see more of each character. <laughs> and this is that one time where I'm like, I wanted more. He made, he actually made something lengthwise that made more sense to me on budgets and things like that. Like if you don't have a big budget, you want to make a really tight and awesome 20 minute feature uh, or short film as opposed to a full one hour and, you know, kind of overdo it or overthink things or make things drag on too long for no reason. And so I was like, oh, this is great. This is shorter. So hopefully it'll be a tighter script. But it was so, you know, condensed that I'm like, I, I kind of want a little bit more because there's neat moments in this, but I don't feel like there's a lot of character development in this personally. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but I thought everyone who played their roles was great because Everyone was also named after planets, which I really liked too. It was like kind of their code names. So there was Mercury and Venus and, you know, Mars, Jupiter and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, that's cool. That fits into the theme of where, you know, a lot of these heist people probably don't use real names for the most part, as, as little as they can. They kept their you know faces covered for the most part. But I did have some criticisms of how they got to the heist, which is to me, I don't see it happening over the phone. <laughs> I feel like, you know, a lot of people in that realm, especially if they're professionals, they probably get a little, you know, worried that, you know, phones could be traced or things like that. And so I can't imagine unless they're using burner phones of some kind, um, which isn't established in the film. But you can, I guess you can assume that. But mostly you see heists done face to face, you know, in, in movies. And again, you can do whatever you want. You can be as creative as you want. And sometimes, like I said, budgets and things like that, you might not be able to get actors in the same room at times. So you have to kind of fake it. And maybe the phone thing was just easier to do. But I would have liked to seen it like start off and just two people talking like two guys talking and one of them being like hey look this is what i need you know and you know they're trying to keep it down they're like you know in public but maybe not in a public place or if they're in a public place they're in some place that's so noisy everyone else would probably just walk by and ignore them um or something like that or maybe you know i don't know like just more visual just two people on the phone i was like ah i feel like more could have been done here maybe again again i don't know the limitations of filming these scenes i don't know if Tajaya and this actor could be in the same place together or not. And so that sometimes does 
change how things are done. But I was just thinking that on the phone, or I thought, you know, what would have been a great thing is after the guy got off the phone, if he broke the phone, you know, showing that it was some kind of burner or disposable phone, and that th th he's covering his tracks to a, a degree. Um, so I thought about that. And then I also thought about how in writing, a lot of times, when you have a heist movie like Ocean's Eleven or something like that, which some of the music felt like a reference to it in this, but there was great music using this, a big compliment there. Um, but sometimes in a heist movie, you'll have someone explain, all right, this is what we're going to do. And that's what this story starts off. You have these two guys talking over the phone. Here's what we're going to do. And you're like, okay, cool. This is the plan. And then typically in a heist movie, something goes wrong in the plan. And then the team has to scramble and, and actually use their skills to get them out of it. And I didn't really see that in this either. And I was just kind of like very, okay, you know, the main character, he wants to finish this heist because whatever they're stealing, this top secret thing they're taking, he has the goal of retiring and him and his girlfriend no longer living in hotel rooms or living with friends and, you know, kind of keeping it on the DL like of their existence. And, you know, they, they want it, they'll now have the money to go live wherever they want and, and have free lives. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's their goal. Um, but there's no like, you know, shakeups in that goal. It just starts with him saying that's his goal and then it ends with them reaching that goal. <laughs> and so it just kind of like, oh, all right. So it, it just kind of felt like a real linear line without a lot of shakeups in it. And I think there's meant to be at one point where they set off the alarm, the motion detector alarm and a cop shows up. But I think because of budget reasons, they couldn't really shoot a full cop chase sequence. So you just see this scene where the driver gets away and I'm like, okay, I can kind of wrap my head and mind around that. Like maybe there's some limitations there, but again, when you face limitations, I feel like also you have to creatively come up with an alternative. And, uh, and so, you know, and, and everything's a learning process. And again, I'm just giving my opinion on stuff, um, based on like tropes and other things that I've learned in writing and not, that doesn't mean it's the right way. That just means that's how I approach things. Right. So I guess my criticisms of this is that the team, there wasn't a lot of focus on them individually. And I thought they were the, like the seeds of really cool characters there, especially the main character, the lookout, because I thought, well, that's neat. That's someone who is, since they were a kid, as he says in the narration, has been a lookout for, you know, different people in his neighborhood to help them like steal candy from the candy store, all the way up to stealing cars and things like that. And I'm like, what a cool backstory. I would have liked to seen more on that character and more of you know his journey and how it ties into how he wants to be free with his girlfriend it's like i would have liked to seen a little bit more of that peppered in to these things and then also with car chase racing sequences maybe uh i don't know again limitation wise but i would have probably if i was writing something like this go to a place where people are street racing and doing stuff late at night and ask if i can just film and i'll you know blur out their license plates or whatever just to get b-roll of actual street racing or cars speeding away or something like that, you know, where it doesn't really cost you anything. And you can just go and ask them for that and say, hey, I'm going to put it in my short film on YouTube for free. Is that cool? You know, you know, I don't have a budget or anything, but I, you guys have cool cars and, um, you know, or whatever. I guess that involves contracts in case the person wrecks their car. <laughs> you know, they're, they're doing something they, you know, weren't going to do originally just to get you some film footage. So I get maybe there's there's issues there, too. But still, I don't know. I would have liked to seen something, even if it was B-roll used from another movie or something, um, just to kind of fill in some of those visual gaps that the movie had or make it like Reservoir Dogs, where you don't ever really see the heist and you do it creatively that way, um, where you never really saw the heist in that movie. And in this one, you just kind of see everything from the lookout's point of view. And that way that can you know explain certain B-roll shots being used, sh stuff being shot at a distance and things like that because he's on a roof looking out or whatever. Like it's just something along those lines I think I was expecting. And maybe that's why I, I have the criticism is because I went in with a certain expectation after watching the trailer and you know kind of seeing what the premise was. And then the setup of the first like two or three minutes of the dialogue and everything. And I was like, okay, I, I, I think I know what we're gonna get into. And then it just kind of felt like this most of the way. And uh, and, I, and I didn't think that was a bad thing per se. I just was expecting some shakeup, I guess. And because I didn't get that shakeup in any way in the story or the script or the characters or anything, um, I was kind of a little let down. And then w one of the drivers, the getaway driver, they set that up in the beginning where they're like, I hope you hire a professional. And then they cut to the getaway driver playing like a PlayStation 5 racing game and he crashes and gets busted by the cops. <laughs> and then like Mercury, the main character, is like, yeah, sure, I hired some professionals. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's cool. That's showing that maybe the plan might not go according to what they set up. And then, but the plan kind of does. And everything down 
to the forklift, like everything goes right. Like normally when you say, hey, all right, put in the code, you, you know, the heist movies will have someone go and put the code in. It doesn't work. So they got to figure out how to get the door open. Then they go in and they're looking for the electric quiet, you know, forklift and oh, the battery died on it or someone didn't charge it late at night or something, some, you know, negligent employee or something. So now they have to use the real forklift, which causes more noise. Um, just things like that. Like those are things that keep the story kind of fun and, and put you on edge and build some tension maybe and wonder if these guys are going to pull this heist off and everything just went really kind of smoothly. And that's probably my biggest criticism is that I feel like it could have used a little bit more shakeup. I mean, I know that's not the kind of the story he was telling, but I think that would have made it a little bit more engaging on my half. Mars, I think, was the getaway driver's name. And I would have liked to have seen more of that kind of personality type of someone who is a getaway driver, but like isn't very good at video game driving away, you know. So uh, that could have been a fun dynamic to play with. And yeah, it just really didn't come across in the overall story. So overall, though, I mean, like I always say, and we've talked about this before, it's like, yes, filmmaking's hard, especially when you have no budget. It's like when you have a ton of budget, it can be hard on a lot of levels. So imagine doing with very little money compared to most, you know, Hollywood productions and other things like that. And even other indie films might have, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to do something. Whereas this, you know, I don't know how much Tajai had, but maybe didn't have nearly that much. And so is working with within the constraints he has. And that's commendable and awesome. And I applaud him as always. And I think he's an amazing talent. And I know that he always puts his best work in. And this is just my feeling on the overall story like the way it shot everything i liked i liked the music i liked everyone in it like there was a lot of positives in this and my only criticism was i guess i was just expecting a bit of a shake-up so that the story didn't just move like this especially on a something like a heist or a getaway story like those just always seem more tense like ronin i always think of that movie ronin um and i think that movie is amazing and they do a really great job of making you wonder and then oceans 11 does it with a little whimsical you know twist to it and have some fun with it uh the remake obviously a uh, version of it and, uh, and even the classic one is fun too and then reservoir dogs which you never see the heist and that's an approach you could have taken too especially on a movie called the lookout and you could have just showed it all from the lookout's point of view and just heard the cars going and him just you know seeing them from a distance you know and trying to help them navigate like how to get out of places or whatever and put all those skills he learned as a kid to use as an adult. And there's only really one scene where he looks outside and doesn't see a cop. And then they go outside, get in the car, and then there is a cop. <laughs> and then they have to speed away from him. So, and the getaway driver turned out to be a good getaway driver, I guess. So a little bit of an arc there, I guess, but we never really saw him drive to begin with. We just saw him drive in a video game. But again, just little critiques from me. I mean, overall, I liked it. I thought everyone in it was great. And I just so great actually that I wanted to see more of their characters. And uh, and that makes me feel like a, like a hypocrite in some way or contradicting myself. Whereas uh, other stories, I'm like, ah, oh, maybe trim it a little bit to Jaya. And then this one, I'm like, man, eh, maybe a little longer. And I would even say you probably could have still kept it at this length and still given us some of those other character moments if some of the other shots and other things were taken out that weren't necessary. Uh, again, just shuffling stuff around. Uh, but I always have this brain of an editor and I always think of editing things. I rarely ever look at something and go, it's fine the way it is. So to be fair to, to Jaya and everybody, that's just how my brain works. It's never satisfied, especially with my own stuff. That's why it takes so long sometimes for me to put out my own things because I can just never be satisfied with what I'm doing. And so, uh, so yeah, consider that as well. But let me know what you think. I'm going to put a link down below to the movie and his channel. Check him out. Subscribe to him. He's an awesome dude. And check out his other short films that he's done on there and his director talks and all the cool special feature things he's been putting out for this movie. Amazing, amazing talent, and I can't wait to see what he does next. And dude, thank you so much to Jaya for letting me watch this again. I'm sorry the review is a little late between the leak in our apartment again and being under the weather and then having to set all this back up again. It's just been a lot. And then obviously with our diagnosis and other things going on, like it's it's been tough. So I apologize again, man, and I'm glad I got this out at least the opening weekend of the movie. And I want everyone to go out there and check it out. Give it some views, give it some likes, and leave your comment and your review in his comment section. And to wrap up this episode, let's talk quickly about Fallout, which is a show that came out on Amazon Prime, and I was lucky enough to watch it. Luckily, we had Prime up until a couple weeks ago, or up like until like a week or two ago, and uh, and Purple was actually one who watched this first, or at least he started it. He watched like one or two episodes, and then I started watching it too, because I saw that he did, and I was like, oh, or I saw someone did. I thought it was Blue at first, but it turns out it was Purple, and he was watching it, and he turned out he liked the show. And uh, ended up really liking the Ella, Ella's character, Lucy, and then also the ghoul. And when I watched it, I also kind of liked Ella's character um, and her journey. And I thought the, uh, her, you know, the journey of Lucy was a really neat one and not one that I 
I kind of anticipated some of it and some of it I didn't. But for me, I really liked Maximus. I thought he was my favorite character in the show. And I really liked his journey of someone who was kind of born in this atom bomb disaster up on the surface, uh, being hidden in a refrigerator and then coming out and getting, a, you know, kind of pulled into this brotherhood, you know, cult church slash, you know, stormtrooper region, you know, legion of people uh, who were... Uh, who were out there to like scavenge the land and, and on like certain missions and stuff and could be paid bounty hunters. And, you know, they have these little golf caddies that walk around with all their weapons, which Maximus was at the start. And then he became an actual soldier. So all these things were just really cool and, and all new to me because although I know of the games, I've never played any of them. And I believe I watched one friend play New Vegas a little bit when it came out, but I myself never played it. But I thought it looked cool. I was like, oh, this is neat, like a an end of the world type scenario story. That's cool. And I really like the little wrist, uh, whatever they're called, uh, pet boys or whatever they're called. Sorry, I'm, I'm butchering the names of stuff. But uh, I really liked those things and like their functions and how they can help advance the story in some way. And, uh, you know, with tracking and stuff, they use that on the show where they're using it to track like, the severed head of a scientist, <laughs> which is really cool. Um, so there's a lot of things like that in this that were, like I said, new to me. But uh, but I also knew the little character, little thumbs up guy and some of his little videos that uh, were used, including like also in Bioshock, they had these little videos that show you how to use plasmids and stuff. And there was a story I wrote a while ago with my friend Gene called The Last Time Traveler. And the idea was to have at the end of each book, because um, it was going to be a four issue miniseries, each issue would end with a two page story kind of shown like that, like a Dudley do right and a Dudley do wrong, showing you how time travel works. And it was going to go over the four rules of time travel, according to our story and how we develop time travel. And it was pulled a lot from like this video of the, the guy with the thumbs up and uh and then also like um you know the plasmid characters and stuff so it kind of had that feel to it like an old 1940s how to do manual type video and uh and so i was like oh cool i'm gonna actually be in this world now of something that i pulled a reference from and a reference i didn't even fully understand and what's cool is this show it kind of lays out the groundwork i don't know what it contradicts video game wise story wise i heard some people say that the bombing that created Maximus, like that, that does disrupt, I guess, the timeline a little bit from the games. Uh, but I got to give it to Jonathan Nolan, who I'm a big fan of. You know, he did Memento uh, back way back when with his brother Christopher Nolan, and he's done, you know, Interstellar, and he's done a lot of stuff over the years. And to see him, you know, take this on and to say, hey, we want to create something that fits in the canon as best we can of the games is also awesome because, you know, I've seen people criticize, like, oh, we, we need more. Fallout games now that the show's out, it would be cool if another new game came out at the same time. But if the show is designed to be the another chapter in this universe, I think it's fine that there's no video game right now. I think they updated the graphics to Fallout 4 and that's out there. Um, so there you have, you know, like an older Fallout game with updated graphics that people can play. Uh, but for the most part, I'm like, why can't people go and play some of those other games? They're still available. You can buy them digitally and stuff. So I don't see what the big issue is and let them have more time to work on the game and make it, you know, good and don't rush anything. Um, because trying to, you know, plan a game and a movie coming out at the same time or a TV show is very, very difficult. Uh, you know, uh, that's why it doesn't happen all the time. And sometimes when we do, one of them suffers. Like, you know, like the movie may be okay, but the video game adaptation of it isn't. Except for Wolverine Origins. That was a great video game adaptation because it was better than the movie uh, big time. So for me with Fallout, like all these characters, like Maximus, like I said, he was my favorite. Um, but Lucy was cool and I liked her journey and her brother and like him going off and doing like a side quest, trying to figure out what's in the other vaults of Vault 32 and 31 and uh, and that whole system. And then also going back in time and showing a lot of the beginning of this before the bombing. Again, I don't know how much that disrupts the, the video game lore, but to me it was it was it's what helped pull me into this because I was like, why well, I, I can't know what to feel sorry for in the present if I don't know what was lost in the past. And I feel like Cooper Howard was a great character to kind of bridge that. And that was played by Walton Goggins, who I'm a huge, huge fan of. And he absolutely kills it on the show, but I have no doubt he would. I mean, ever since he played Shane on The Shield and then all the stuff, Sons of Anarchy, everything he's been in, like he is a top-notch talent. And I think he's fantastic of an actor, one of my favorites to this day. And when I heard he was going to be on the show, I was like, oh, that's cool. That makes me want to watch the show. And then that's why I eventually caved in. I was like, well, someone, one of us already watched it. And I'm like, let me see and check it out because Walton Goggins is in it. And I, I want to see how he is. And the show starts with him. You see a little bit of his backstory. You see him as an actor who is now not acting. And he's doing like, you know, 
birthday parties and stuff and he brings his daughter with them and he you know they ride a horse and he's spinning the the rope around and everything and i'm like you immediately kind of were drawn to him and like what his story was and then when you find out as you go through of him becoming this creature that outlives a lot of people and lives almost 200 years it's really really neat like i i just thought that was all cool and yeah of course i'm getting into spoilers here the show's been out for a couple weeks but um i won't go through every detail i just want to give you my overall feeling of the show and how they did character and how they developed story from this i thought was really good is it a perfect show no i had some criticisms and there were some things i was like eh, i don't really get this or i don't really get that too much or maybe that needs to be explained more and that could be because it's birth from the game and i have to know the game better to kind of wrap my head around some of that but Whereas normally that's a detriment where I feel like, oh, if I need to play the game to understand this fully, then that's not good writing. In this, I understand fully what the story and the stakes are. And that's the most important part. If there's little like background Easter egg things that I'm like, oh, why are they using that tool to do that or whatever? Like, that's okay. To me, that doesn't like completely break my mind trying to get into the show. Uh, that's just background superfluous stuff. And to me, it, as long as the main story and the characters and the stakes as long as I can wrap my head around that and understand all that, then the show is doing an amazing job, especially adapting a video game. Now, I haven't seen Last of Us. I heard that was a good adaptation. But unfortunately, I've seen all the Resident Evil garbage and the Silent Hill garbage. And to me, I haven't seen too many, you know, great adaptations of video games. Mario was fun. You know, it was a kid movie. And so was Sonic. That was a lot of fun, too. So there are, I know it exists, and I know it's not impossible to do it. Halo, I also think, is not a very great show. Um, I don't think it's, you know, absolute garbage like the Resident Evil ones are, but it's not great, in my opinion. It's not even that good, in my opinion. So to see this and to see that fans hopefully are, you know, I, I hope fans are happy that this adaptation exists because... I thought it was a really good one as a non-fan, as an outsider who respects, you know, the world of Fallout without knowing, you know, diving, ever diving into it, but going, oh, I know it's massive. I know people love it. Um, it's just like, I don't play a lot of games that are, you know, 30, 40 hours to beat or more. It's very rare when I do that uh, just because of time and, and everything. So typically what I do is I watch people online play it and kind of get glimpses of the world and or watch friends play it and get glimpses through them. So that's my exposure to Fallout, and I've always been like, wow, this is a really rich universe to mine from. I wonder what an adaptation would look like of this. And when I saw this show and how well it's pulled off, I was like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> to me, it's impressive because I uh, I wouldn't have thought of going, all right, let's make a story set in the world that already exists. That seems like a very daunting task for something with as much rich lore. And obviously, they didn't get everything right, um, but I feel like at least from my knowledge of it, most of the things they got wrong can kind of be side explained in a way if you really try. Um, but uh, but I also know the games have multiple endings and that does make it harder to pick a canon of like how you're going to set your story. So, you know, there's that too. But the show, like, you know, Lucy being this really naive person living underground, you know, hearing that one day you'll, you'll go up to the surface and you'll, you'll be free and, you know, we'll have a reclamation day or whatever. And, and, uh, and your kids will bring in this new usher, uh, you know, this new time of peacefulness on earth and humans will take over the world again and, and rebuild and all that stuff. And, uh, and it's just that whole thing. And then she goes out and her bubble is just completely burst and it is a dangerous world. And it's a great allegory for just anyone who's young and going out into the world. I think it had that very much, uh, that, uh, that hero's journey feeling, you know, uh, of like leaving, you know, your home to go find, you know, your home essentially, or to find your growth or to find your strength or power. And that's kind of the journey she goes on. And by the end, she does toughen up. I mean, she's still not like a, a, a you know, cut your throat, hardcore killer or anything like that. But she does make choices that kind of break her original morals so she could survive and, and complete her mission of trying to find her father. It's very important, obviously. And then when you do, you know, the answer she gets from that is uh, is really overwhelming to her, too. And how it all connects to Cooper Howard and his wife, Barb, and their backstory. And um, and then, the, you know, this cult that, you know, rose up in, in California and everything, which I guess is from the games, you know. And there's all these things. They're up in the Griffith Observatory at one point, which was really cool because um, I used to hike up there all the time when I lived in L.A. And there's just all these neat things in the show that I just thought, like, came full circle where it's like, all right, here's some setups. And here's some payoffs. And it's like, okay, why do these ghoul type characters need this chem to survive? And then they kind of explain that without like drilling it in your head. 
and they show you visually a lot of times how it like they you see a different ghoul and they're tweaking out and then there's the place that lucy goes to with the robot voiced by matt barry <laughs> which is so awesome i think his name was mr handy or something and i i like that whole thing too where they show the cooper and and his character in the past when they were you know humans and they were talking and he's like yeah i just did gave my voice to this robot thing that they're going to develop and he's like and wouldn't that be weird they gave me one for free so now i have a butler at my house who has my voice and then you see that robot later on in the future 200 years later and it has his voice and everything and it's trying to like chop lucy up into pieces after it like reattaches a finger to her and there's like a lot of dark humor in it. i thought it was really cool but then when lucy gets out she, you know, shoots out the glass or whatever, she hits the alarm thing, and she frees all the other people that are turning into ghouls, including some that have gone too far, and you start seeing what they're like. And and then you see what, you know, what's happening to Cooper and why he needs the chems. And, and his journey of, you know, is very much mirrors Lucy, uh, her journey of looking for family. So I like that. And then Maximus, too, he's kind of, in a way, looking for family. He lost his in the big explosion, and now, he, you know, he went to this cult, and then now, he, as he's being this warrior and going through and, and making these moral choices to save Lucy and to help people when he can um, and try to fight the ghoul, even though he's definitely not prepared for that, but he still tries anyway. He's kind of like dumb brave in some regards and naive brave in some regards, but he mirrors Lucy too. And they kind of feel like they're all on this path of looking for a family, but different types, you know, um, like some actual family, like in the case of the ghoul and Lucy, and then also Maximus kind of like a metaphorical family. And, and even to the point where he's kind of content when they go to this one uh, vault that has like uh, people having orgies in it and <laughs> it's all this stuff. And I'm like, wow, that's uh, that was a lot. And like I said, a lot of just they just go for it in the show. They're just like, uh, you know, unapologetic about it. They're like, yeah, we're just yeah, this vault is just a bunch of people who some are mutated, some aren't. And they they do this thing where they have an orgy every once in a while. And it's just like <laughs> and they just say it like it's just like it's nothing. And it just made me laugh. I'm like, this show is just really kind of has balls like you know in a way where it just doesn't care what um what i mean i guess it cares what message it's sending to an extent but it also is showing you like that everyone is different you know like uh people when they're hunkered down in these vaults when they're told about the world outside or when they're from the world outside like their pers everyone's perspectives on things are different and i i really kind of enjoyed that part of the show that no character even though the three main characters feel like they're on a similar journey a lot of characters just felt different and they made choices that I felt like some of the, like Lucy's brother, I felt made some choices that Lucy wouldn't make and, and vice versa. And I just thought that was really neat and it may, it helped separate the characters really well. And in the end, it made for a really great show in my opinion. And so I would say like, you know, the show itself, although I don't think it's perfect um, because I, I nitpick a lot of things, obviously, um, but I wasn't trying to, I was just like, oh, there's some things I, I, I don't know if I like that or this scene. I didn't think that was shot too well or whatever, but those are minor compared to how I just felt overall watching it and how I felt was, wow, this is really good. And funny enough, Purple also really liked it. And even though we pulled different characters that were our favorites, um, I still feel like like he was big on Walton Goggins and the ghoul, which is awesome because I'm a Walton Goggins fan. So I was like, hey, that's cool. Look, our taste isn't, we're not too dissimilar uh, in that regard. But um, But for me, Maximus, and Lucy and that story was fantastic. And it reminded me a little bit of Star Wars in, in a sense where they had like Ray and Finn and how they never pulled the trigger on that relationship. And instead they leaned Ray more towards Kylo Ren and how much I personally didn't like that. I was like, oh, I would have liked if her and Finn, you know, like became love interests and, and they fought this battle together and try to figure out who they were, you know, and what their journeys were together. Like, I just thought that would have made more sense to me. And uh, it, based on how the you know Force Awakens set it up. And then I just feel like Disney didn't have the balls to really go forward with that relationship. And I was like, that's sh crappy. Like, so when I saw this one and I was like, yeah, this show is like, you know, it's like these two are starting to fall in love and they're starting to find their way as adults and in this world together. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. That's kind of what I was looking for in Force Awakens. So this, I felt like this scratched a little bit of an itch for me of like just the setup of a character development and an actual payoff, whereas Star Wars set it up and then didn't pay it off because they gave it to other writers and directors who kind of, in my opinion, went the opposite way of where it should have went. So so for me, I'm like, I don't know. In the end, I, I think this show really stuck to its guns and it really stuck to the vision that Jonathan Nolan and other people on the show had. And everyone seemed to be on the same page on making this something fun and entertaining and also, um, you know, creepy at times, funny, dark, you know, like, uh, you know, dramatic. I mean, there's a lot of emotions in this show 
And I thought that made it a very well-rounded show. While also it's like gory, you know, at times, but it has like naivete to it. And it's like, and I think because of the naivete it makes the gore seem more gory than it normally would. If you just saw this show and the char main character wasn't naive and you saw some of the gore, you'd be like, eh, whatever, I've seen gore like that before. But I think because she's so innocent uh, to an extent, like when you're watching it, you the, the blood seems bloodier almost because you're kind of seeing it through her eyes. And I really dug that. And so I thought everything on this show when it comes to character, story, plot, music, um, you know, all that, I, even directing, I thought was very well executed and it made me really enjoy the show and it makes me want to play one of the games now. So if you have a suggestion of what game I should play, whether it's New Vegas or the 4 remake or 3, I know a lot of people said I should play 3, um, you know, let me know down in the comments below and maybe at some point I'll try to get into the world. And if not, if I don't have the time, at least I'll have some on in the background. You can recommend some good streamers to me. And I'll watch their playthrough of it, especially if they do lore dives, because those are my favorite playthroughs is when people are talking about the lore of the world they're playing. So if you know anyone out there who's a big Fallout person and they talk a lot about the lore, let me know in the comments and I'll definitely check them out as well. Let me know what you think down below of the show. Did you like Fallout? And did you check out Lookout? Please go check that film out from my friend Tajaya. I'll put a link to his channel down below and to his film. And then let me know all your thoughts down below of those two projects that we talked about tonight down there. But please, if you can... Please leave your comments on Tajaya's page also if you have any reviews or anything you want to talk about. You know, he's an awesome dude, so please go leave some comments on his and flood his page as well and get some of those views up on his channel and give him a thumbs up, right? Fallout? Awesome. <laughs> Cringe. Thank you so much for watching the show as always. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.